Do you think that women can run defense companies better than men, or they can run all companies better than men? <laughs> I would just say, uh, David, it's a team sport. It isn't, it isn't all about me. Donald Trump sent out a tweet saying that your biggest product, the F-35, was too expensive. So I personally engaged, my team engaged, to have a chance to have a dialogue with him. What's so unique about the F-35? It is the most advanced fighter in the world. You were recently voted the 22nd most powerful woman in the entire world. I get a note from my brother that said, well, why was Oprah higher than you or something like Dang that? It. But, you know. Okay. Would you fix your tie, please? Well, people wouldn't recognize me if my tie was fixed, but okay. <laughs> Just leave, leave it, it this way. All right. I don't consider myself a journalist. And nobody else would consider myself a journalist. I began to take on the life of being an interviewer, even though I have a day job of running a private equity firm. How do you define leadership? What is it that makes somebody tick? Since you've been the, the CEO, the stock has gone up roughly 330%. The market capitalization is up roughly 280%. Uh, another company that you compete with, General Dynamics, has a female CEO as well, and their stock is up about 250% since she became um, <laughs> Uh, the CEO, that's Phoebe Novakovic. Um, do you think that women can run defense companies better than men, or they can run all companies better than men? I'm just looking at the audience, who, how many women are out there clapping, but, uh, David, oh. <laughs> I would just say, uh, David, it's a team sport. It isn't, it isn't all about me on, on the performance of our company, but I'm really proud about what our team has been able to accomplish over the last five, six years. I'm in my sixth year as CEO. So, so when you walk into the shareholders' meetings, do they give you a standing ovation? It must be pretty happy. We have some happy shareholders, yes, but they always, you know, they always keep, keep a beat on us to make sure that we, we're constantly creating value. So it's, it's what have you done for me lately. Okay. So, um, <laughs> okay, during the transition of the... President of the United States, Donald Trump sent out a tweet saying that your biggest product, the F-35, was too expensive. And I think you were out of the country at the time? I was. I was in Israel where we were delivering their first two F-35s. So what was your reaction to the President of the United States tweeting that you were charging the U.S. government too much? Well, first of all, we needed to, to get those aircraft delivered. And, and, you know, one of the most interesting things was that Prime Minister Netanyahu, he was at that event and he asked me about the fact that our new president was going to get a better price on those aircraft and, you know, maybe he should get a rebate on the ones that we were delivering. So that presented a bit of a challenge, but, uh, you know, we, you know, what was important was to recognize what our president-elect was communicating. I mean, he was trying to communicate to the American people that he was going to be, that he was going to get good deals on the equipment that he purchased and, and that he was going to increase defense spending, but he was going to make sure that he spent the taxpayer's dollar wisely. And so uh, we, so, I personally engaged, my team engaged to have a chance to have a dialogue with him. So you did give him a little discount? We drove the price down, yes. We got, you know, we got the deal done and we did okay. it in an accelerated fashion and, we, and he, he definitely had an influence on that. Now, since he's been president, the defense budget is now higher than it's ever been. I think over, when you count everything, over $700 billion annually. So is this a great time to be a defense company CEO? Well, let me just put it in perspective for you. We're certainly encouraged by the fact that, that our country is now spending more on defense. But if you just sort of look back over the last few years, it's, we're playing catch up in a large way. We certainly want to maintain our technological superiority over our adversaries or over the potential adversaries. What it's meant for industry is that we managed through that downturn, just like any well-managed company. Right. But we didn't invest at the level that we would, would have in terms of innovation, in terms of uh, other areas of the business, because okay. we were in a down cycle. Now with the up cycle, it's time for us to really bring forth the innovations and, and continue to, to spend the efforts that we had to align with the priorities of our customers. So do you need a security clearance, and how long does it take to get one of those? <laughs> 
Well, you know, 60,000 of our employees have security clearances, so it's a very important element of our business. I personally have to have certain, uh, we have some sensitive and classified information that I need to be briefed on, so I have the appropriate clearance associated with that. So let me talk about your background. You grew up in Kansas, and your father died when you were nine years old, and you had four siblings, and how did your mother support five children? Well, it was tough, frankly. I mean, my father was, uh, he was with the Department of the Army, and my mother uh, was the at-home mom with five children, and it knocked the props out of, you know, what was, we were, we were not, you know, we were average family, but set us back a lot. But I give great credit to my mother, who uh, raised five children on her own, and she just passed away a couple of years ago at 97, so, I mean, incredibly wow. life that she had. And, nice. and... She was she from Alabama? Us, she, she was from Alabama, but she taught us the value of a dollar. You know, we had to learn how to economize at a very young age. She'd send us in to pay the power bill, the electric bill. She just got her kids out and said, you've got to learn how to do these things because you've got to be, it taught me to be very self-reliant, I would say. Well, I was told that she used to say to you, um, go to the grocery store, here's $5, and bring back $7 of groceries. Yes, <laughs> that's true. That's very true. So, learn how to economize. So I learned early how to economize, yes. Okay, so you went to University of Alabama, mm -hmm. and uh, did you get a scholarship and you didn't have to work? Oh, no, I didn't have a scholarship. I, I worked nights. I worked uh, on what was called the graveyard shift, so to speak, from 11 at night to 7 in the morning, and then I went to class from 8 to 1 or 2, and then I'd sleep unless I had a date, and then uh, I'd go right back to work and without sleeping, because you can do that when you're 18 or 19 years old. But uh, yes, I worked full time, uh, paid my own way through school, finished in three and a half years, and um, and you know you do what you do, what you had to do. So okay. I okay. So after you graduated, did you say I want to be the CEO of Lockheed Martin, or <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> no, I started looking for a job. I took a job as an economist here in Washington with the Bureau of Labor Statistics out of out of college. They were in the midst of redoing the producer price index. It was a good job for a grad student to come in. And so I actually started my career here. Four years later, we looked for the next position, and I, uh, and I interviewed at several companies, one of which was Lockheed in Marietta, Georgia, and started there as a senior industrial engineer. So when you went to Marietta, Georgia, uh, you worked your way up. You had, I think, 22 different leadership positions. Mm -hmm. So you must have been moving around a lot. I was in Marietta for about 13 years. I, 18 months in, I was promoted to supervisor in industrial engineering, and then about the two-year mark, I was put on a general management development program, and great credit to uh, a sponsor that, that he put me forward for the program, so I spent two years rotating around the company, and at the end of the two years, I was a manager over all of our production estimating right. and budgets. Now, at one point, uh, your husband was unemployed, and he got a job uh, interview with a company, and what company was that? Yeah, he surprised me a bit. Uh, he, his company went out of business, and so he was out looking for a job. We had a five-month-old baby, so we were very much hoping he'd find a job. And it was a tough labor market at the time, but uh, he came home one day and he said, okay, I got a job. And I said, where? And he said, at Lockheed. And I went, what? You're at Lockheed? Oh, sorry. I said, what? Why, why my company? You know, but it just turned out he went to work in the finance department. We didn't really cross paths. I was, in, I was running industrial engineering by that time. But it's interesting, uh, for about five years, he retired from Lockheed after five years. <laughs> so you have uh, given him a lot of credit for what you've been able to achieve, because yes. you might describe, after he retired, he took on the role that you know many people would say a woman might have normally taken on, or the wife, and he took on that traditional role. Is that fair to say? Yes. I say he retired. I mean, our kids were three and six, two boys, and uh, we moved from Marietta, Georgia, to Fort Worth, Texas, because my job moved us. And so at that time, we, you know you know how stressful it is to have a couple of young children at home. And so we, I said, well, why don't we try you working from home for a year? And we just never changed the model. So he became the at-home dad. He, you know, he was the coach. He was the, the scout leader. He was the, went on the field trips, and he managed that, because I traveled a lot in my job. And it, we were maybe a new age family back then in the way that we worked, but it worked for us. And, Today our kids are in their 20s and they're off doing their thing and he's, he, but when I said he retired, he basically was that five year right. mark. He, he got, 
he got a retirement check from Lockheed Martin not long ago. So, <laughs> so he, okay, uh, well. he's five years, right? <laughs> So I guess he's happy with the uh, shareholder performance as well. Yes, he is. <laughs> Costs a lot of money to make the Marine One because you've got to have all kinds of security things in there. That's right. You know, it's based on this S-92, which is a great commercial helicopter. If you're interested in a helicopter, David, I would, I'd okay. suggest you look at that. Maybe, maybe get something to get a good deal. Do you get a discount if you buy two or something? No. Um, we, can, we can do okay. a deal. a moment about um, the product I mentioned earlier. They're fighter jets. Now, I've known for a long time there's an F-14, F-15, F-18, there was an F-22, and then you'd come up with something called the F-35. What happened between 22 and 35? <laughs> well, the fact is that aircraft are not numbered by Lockheed Martin. I mean, they're, the U.S. government determines what, what the number is. So, an F standing for a fighter, a B for a bomber, you know, the, the, the terminology is kind of general and, and usually it is sequential. Uh, we, had, we won the contract uh, with, with our X-35, which was, was the experimental, uh, you know, you named them with an X or a Y if they were experimental or a prototype. So we had named our, our offering in this competition. But when they announced the winner, Lockheed was the winner, and, and the Secretary of the Air Force said uh, the F-35, and we were all shocked because we thought it was going to be the F-23. <laughs> so once he named it, that's what number it became. You didn't want to tell him he made a mistake, I guess, since he just awarded the contract. But so in the history of our country, this is the biggest defense contract ever, tens of billions of dollars, I assume. Um, why does it cost that much to make these planes, and what, what's so great about this plane? What's so unique about the F-35? The F-35A, which is your conventional variant of the aircraft, was priced at uh, $94.3 million. And we're on a path to drive that down to $80 million by 2020. Think about that. You know, you think about if you fly, a, maybe you fly a Gulf Stream or something like that. Think about what you paid for that and think about the most, <laughs> think about the most uh, sophisticated uh, jet fighter in the world that might right. cost $80 million. I mean, that's pretty remarkable in my mind. It is, it is the most advanced fighter in the world. So it, it is basically a force multiplier. It's a fabulous aircraft. And I don't have to tell you that. Talk to some of the pilots that fly it. The SR-71 was a very famous plane that uh, I think now is in the, in the Air and Space Museum of the Smithsonian. It went at, I think, six times the speed of sound or something like that. Three times, yeah. Very high. So there's a rumor. <laughs> There was a rumor in the defense press somewhere that you're making an SR-72. Um, so can you tell us right now, is that true? You know, we are working on hypersonics, and hypersonics would be something over Mach 5. Uh, we're doing work in that technology, okay. and it's important technology. So that's probably all I'm going to say about it. OK. okay. <laughs> all right. OK. Let's talk a moment about artificial intelligence. Presumably, that's going to be very important for defense contractors, as it is for other companies. Well, that's a very important area that we're investing in. We think our customers are looking for solutions in that, to use that technology. But in artificial intelligence, you can think about we're working on a helicopter that will be unmanned. So that's an opportunity. Unmanned helicopter. An unmanned helicopter. We have other unmanned vehicles that we have, but that autonomy and using the artificial intelligence for actually oh, flying a what's helicopter. What's the price for the unmanned? Is a little bit. <laughs> All right, um, so unmanned helicopter, that's, yeah. that sounds pretty novel. But even in the cockpit of our, our aircraft, you know, it's very, using the artificial intelligence by fusing information in such a way that the pilot doesn't have to, you, know, you, you can't, the human mind just can't move at the same speed as what you can get through that computing right. power. And so they can make the right decisions to deal with the situation. And we have, we have such things as um, collision and avoidance. So even on our F-16s, and we'll be putting this on our F-35, uh, we have technology there through artificial intelligence that if a pilot doesn't realize that they're about ready to hit the ground, this aircraft will take control and avoid. We've already saved six pilots' lives with that type of technology. So that's just a few examples of how we apply the artificial intelligence. 
Now, one of your other products is a uh, helicopter. You bought Sikorsky helicopter from uh, United Technologies. Correct. Uh, why did you buy it, and uh, are they making uh, the Marine One, which is the President's helicopter, and how much does that cost? <laughs> You're into the prices, aren't you, David? Well, I'm <laughs> okay. always trying to get a, you know, I'm always negotiating for a good deal. But, <laughs> I see, um, okay, all right. Well, first of all, yes, we bought Sikorsky. It's been doing business with them for over 40 years. And so when the opportunity came up, we took the opportunity to buy the company. Great integration into our company. It brings a Black Hawk helicopter. It brings a CH-53K uh, helicopter for the Marine Corps. And as you mentioned, the Marine One. I'm happy to say that that program is on schedule and on cost in producing that okay, for, but it costs for the a president. Lot of, it costs a lot of money to make Marine One because you've got to have all kinds of security things in there. Yes. So it's not something you can sell to any other country, I assume. So you. You only make, what, 23 of them you're going to make or something like yes, that? Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And when are they going to be available? I think it's 2019 or so that they'll come right. forward. So, but I was going to mention to you, you know, it's based on this S-92, which is a great commercial helicopter. If you're interested in a helicopter, David, I would, I'd okay. suggest you look at um, I mean, you know, well, I think they're um, only around, you know, so, um, $35, $40 million. I mean, uh, I'm sure well, you could do that. Negotiate. Maybe maybe get something, good, get a good deal. Do you get a discount if you buy two or something? No. Um, we can we can do okay. a deal. When you started out, were you often the only woman in the room at, 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 uh, at Lockheed? I was. But after that, once you're contributing and you're part of the team, it, it was no longer a factor. You were recently voted the 22nd most powerful woman in the entire world. Did you say I should be higher or did you say <laughs> um, I should be, that's pretty high. I get a note from my brother that said, well, why was Oprah higher than you or something like Dang that? It. But, you know. Okay. What's it like to be the CEO of our nation's largest defense contractor? You get about 70% of your revenue, I think, from the U.S. government. You know, how much of your time do you have to spend with the U.S. government? How do you spend your time, let's say, in a typical week percentage time? I would say somewhere between 60 to 70% of my time is with the strategy of the business, the customers, and engagement around the world, the traveling around the world on the, on the customer side of the business. Because it's important in my role to be out meeting with not only our congressional leaders and our government leaders to make sure we're aligned with what their needs are and their priorities, but I travel a lot outside of the United States. 30% of our business is outside of the United States with governments around the world. You were recently voted the 22nd most powerful woman in the entire world, not just business, but everything. So when you saw that, did you say I should be higher or did you say um, I should be, that's pretty high. I mean, uh, and how does it feel to be the 22nd most powerful female in the entire planet of 3.6 billion women? You know, I don't focus on it that much, David. I mean, I, I get a note from my brother that said, well, why was Oprah higher than you or something okay, like that? But you, know, okay. but, you know, that's not something I'm focused, there's lots of lists. I mean, it really comes down to having the privilege of, of leading a national asset and, and a, a company that's doing some of the most important okay. and interesting work in the world. When you started out, were you often the only woman in the room at, 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 uh, at Lockheed? I was, yes. And so was that intimidating or was it the uh, kind of thing where you said, I can show them I'm better than them, the men? You know, I, I think it's like any team you come into, you have to establish your credibility, recognizing that I was a different gender, so maybe the, you know, the first moment I was different in that sense. But after that, once you're contributing and you're part of the team, it, it was no longer a factor for me, at least in, in through my career. But what I'll tell you is really positive is that today, 22% uh, of our leaders are women, 24, 25% of our workforce are women. So the pipeline of women, it's no longer the only, there's only one woman in the room. Right. We have many women leaders in the room and, and it's, you know, we've come a long way on the pipeline. Back 35 years ago, there weren't as many women coming out of engineering and, and other professions to come into the, to the workforce, just as the case was for a customer. But you look at our customer day, look at our military services, how many women are in, involved, how many men and women, but women are in, in uniform and and in leadership positions, it's just a pipeline issue. And we're always working on that pipeline to get more women. Okay, and what do you do for relaxation? Are you an exercise person? Or are you a traveler or sports or whatever? Well, I like to play golf. My husband and I like to get out and play some golf as relaxation. I like to travel. I mean, our family gets together and travels. I, I travel a lot for the job, probably 40, 50% of my time. I travel on a 
business travel, but uh, one of the things we really enjoy is getting together as a family to, to travel and always try to create some fun travel that our kids will find as long as mom and dad pays for it and it's fun, they'll come. <laughs> some people say that the higher a handicap of a CEO, the better the stock will perform. If it's a low handicap, that means the CEO is spending too much time playing golf. So You're not going to ask me my handicap, are you, David? I assume you're, what your handicap is, <laughs> you're, are you a, not a scratch golfer, I No assume. way, no, no. I don't play enough for that. Okay. And today, <laughs> but it sounds it must be pretty low. Um, so you can beat your husband, or is he better than you, or? No, well, He's better than me, but you know, I always remind him that there's the average for women and there's the average for men, and so as long as I can okay. be. And if he has a close putt, do you just give it to him or just make him put it out? No. <laughs> so uh, today, what is the biggest challenge the U.S. defense industry has? Well, the challenge that we have is really the challenge our customers have. I mean, we have a, a, an environment where the threats today are so difficult around the world, the global security environment is so unpredictable and is changing so rapidly. So you have the need for solutions to address that and to stay ahead of the threat and stay ahead of the adversaries. At the same time, we have constrained budgets and the budget pressures that we faced over the last several years. And, and maybe we're having to spend money on near term getting things back up to readiness instead of investing in what we need to. To, to address the power competitions that we have out there with our adversaries. So that then in turn is a challenge for industry because if you haven't been investing along the way, we've got to, you know, we've got to move with speed while at the same time driving costs down. Now what about cyber warfare? That must be an important part of your business it now. Is. How do you make certain that our enemies around the world aren't trying to get your secrets? Well, I can't, I mean, they are trying to get our secrets. <laughs> I mean, this is a constant threat that a company like ours and many countries, companies have in the U.S. Uh, of, of other countries trying to get at our secrets. And we take it very seriously because we know that we are a target and, and government customers are a target. So we have, we've invested a lot in the technologies that, to protect that. But I think it's a constant, you know, these, these threats are advanced and they're asymmetric and they're constantly changing and it's, it's really important for us to stay on top of that and keep investing in it. I mentioned earlier, uh, since you became the CEO, your stock is up. If I bought some stock tomorrow, uh, would I also see a very significant gain in four or five years or do you think it's, the prices are already so high for the defense stocks? Well, David, I'm not going to advise you on the stock price today. I think you're really good at that. But I would tell you this, for our company, we are always focused on creating shareholder value. So just know that's our commitment, okay. and we're going to drive the company for growth and for innovation and for shareholder okay. value. Well, as long as you're the CEO, I'd probably be happy to be an investor. But how long might you be the CEO? Do you, um, <laughs> you have any plans? If the President of the United States called you and said, I'd like you to be Secretary of Defense or something like that, would you entertain that or you're going to stay where you are for a while? Well, in our company, I mean, I, I'm, it, I feel very privileged. I love the work that we do. I a team of remarkable people that I work with that, you know, have the highest integrity. They are so dedicated and so talented. I love working at Lockheed Martin and I serve at the pleasure of the board of directors. So how long I work will be up to them. But today I'm really enjoying the work that I'm doing and I have no intention okay. of stepping down from my role. Right. Whenever you do in step down, time. at some point you might step down, at some point, 10 mm -hmm. years, 15, 20 years, <laughs> would you consider the higher calling of private equity? <laughs> no. well, you know, as I told you, I have a passion for business. I might very okay. well consider right. that, David. Well, whenever you do step down, please let me know. And okay. I'm happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.